Okay. No problem. Uh huh. Okay. Found it. All right, so uh, we're on chapter three of uh, the book of Judges, and today's October 22nd. That's all good. Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together this evening, for all that have been able to join, for everyone that watches the video later. Lord, we pray a blessing upon each. Reach us, teach us. Um, just show us what it is that we need to know about the passage tonight and what we can learn throughout this whole book of Judges. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Pop quiz. Get out a pencil and a piece of paper. Number one to 50. No, don't do that. Don't do that. I just lost everybody, right? No, I was looking around for a pencil. I was like, uh-oh, I'm not prepared for class. I wouldn't do that to you guys. Um, so anyway, let's see. Yeah, okay, there's Stephanie. I was afraid maybe I'd lost you. All right. Um, so who read chapter three? I know Angela did. She she quoted us a passage. <laughs> Anybody else read it? Today? I read it. Okay, good. Well, no, I didn't read it. What's that? Okay. Um, we'll go back and we'll review a little bit of chapter two. Um, so chapter two is the second of two introductions. The first was a military problem uh, as the, the Hebrews were entering the promised land. This cha second chapter raised, lays out the religious problems that the Israelites faced, the, the Hebrews um, uh, faced, and I just call them Israelites because that'll get confusing. Um, and uh, the religious problem was that the Israelites disobeyed God. They uh, turned from what he had told them to do several times as they were traveling uh, to the promised land. He made covenant with them that uh, if they did what he told them, they would be blessed. They would be given this land, and uh, they they didn't do it. They started living uh, living with the inhabitants of the area instead of um, instead of staying separate, driving the inhabitants that were there out of the promised land. Um, and they even started intermarrying, networking, which again was something that God told them not to do. Uh, they started worshiping the gods of the Canaanites, and we'll talk more about that and about the intermarrying later on tonight. They turned away from God, who brought them out of Egypt to the promised land. By the end of the chapter, we saw this pattern, apostasy, which is turning your back on God. Uh, then there, after they did that, there was hardship. Something happened. Uh, they became slaves, or they had to fight battles. And then there was moaning. The, the Israelites cried out uh, to God to rescue them, and God would raise up a, a rescuer. A, 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 I don't want to say a savior, but someone came along and rescued them. That's, that was the job of a lot of these judges. And I'd had some confusion last week. I couldn't remember how many major judges are. There's 12. Uh, which is an interesting number. There's 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of the uh, the Hebrew children, the Israelites, and there's 12 major judges. Don't know 12 disciples. There. What's that? 12 disciples. 12 disciples, yeah. Uh, I'm not into a lot of that Bible, biblical numerology, but there, there, are some, there are some patterns throughout the Bible, sevens and twelves and... Um, Maybe they all have some connection somewhere through there. I'll read up on some numerology next week and see if I can provide you some. <coughs> all right. So, 
chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it formerly. These nations are the five lords of the Philistines and all of the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, as far as Lebo Leboama. They were, test they were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. The sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. A lot of sites. And they took their daughters for themselves as wives, and they gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. So, several nations that remained in the land, uh, but before we get into that, that's what, that's breaking the covenant right there. That if the uh, Israelites would uphold their end, God would uphold their, his end, and the, the uh, Israelites blew it. Supposed to drive out the people in, in the promised land, they didn't do it. Not supposed to worship the other gods, they did that. Not supposed to intermarry, they did that. Um, so at least three things they've done that have messed up the covenant. Um, wanted to briefly tell you about these. Uh, the Philistines, uh, we, we, we see the Philistines all throughout the Old Testament. Um, they actually live in the area in the south of the promised land. They're like sea dwellers. They, they have ships and they travel a lot by water uh, to get from place to place when there is water to travel with. Uh, the five lords, um, lords could actually be, be translated more as tyrants. Um, the, these leaders of the Philistines are just, they're terrible, terrible people. The Philistines are a horrible race. They, they just, they wipe out everything in their path. Uh, Goliath was a Philistine. So that, that tells you a little bit there. The, Goliath was the biggest of them. And you remember the story of David slaying him. But that's who they were battling in that story with the Philistines. The Canaanites lived all over the promised land. That, that land was called Canaan. And so the, the original inhabitants would have been these Canaanites. The Sidonians and the Hivites, they're small sects, uh, small groups that have, uh, that kind of broke off from the Canaanites. Some of them traveled to the promised land, but for the most part, um, it was, uh, they were just small little groups that uh, the Israelites had to deal with uh, here and there. So why do you think the intermarriage in the covenant was forbidden? by God. Because I think he knew that they were going to go along with their wives and worship the idols instead of God. Yeah. Yeah, that that's one of them. I, another another thing in the in with the intermarrying uh, is that it threatened the genealogical purity of the Israelites. These are God's people and he didn't he didn't want uh, the the genealogy to be confused uh, with, with these other tribes and when once you uh, these other peoples uh, once you start intermarrying then the children are going to have uh, DNA and, and that sort of thing from both races not just the Israelites any longer and then that's the standard that God measured uh, Israel the Israelites loyalty um, he, he set that as one of the one of the markers. Before we move on, is there anything else that you guys want to ask or talk about in verses one through six? There, there's a lot of different tribes that that they had to fight throughout 
a lot of different peoples that they had to fight throughout uh, those first six verses. Okay. Verses 7 through 11. This will be a short one. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot their, the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, Rishathaim eight years. When the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. Then the land had for, had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So Othniel is the uh, the first major judge, uh, the the first judge that we're going to study. There are there are um, minor judges that aren't really named in the book, but they are. Uh, it does say in the first couple of chapters that there were. Um, Judges that rose up and took care of problems within the the tribes, uh, little squabbles and that sort of thing. So this is the first major judge. Do you remember hearing about Caleb in the first chapter? Caleb was one of the initial spies that Moses sent into Canaan when the Hebrews reached the promised land. And Othniel is actually mentioned in the first chapter. He's the one that married Caleb's daughter, Aksha, Aksha, sorry, because uh, he took the city of Debir at Caleb's request. And Caleb, uh, if you remember, <coughs> Caleb told them, whoever takes Debir will have my daughter's hand in marriage. And then the daughter went back later and asked for... Uh, uh, fresh water, I think that he gave them the upper lake and the lower lake, or it was something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway. So it was his uncle. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Caleb and Kenaz, <laughs> who is Othniel's dad, father, was were brothers. Okay. Kenaz and Caleb are brothers. Okay. All right. So the passage we just read, we see that framework again. That that framework that starts out with apostasy. And I put the actual verse in there. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgetting the Lord their God and worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs, which are the Canaanite gods. Um in the original text, both of those names are plural. I think I covered that a little bit last week. Uh, it ju it's just meant to be a plethora of gods and goddesses that the Canaanites and some of the other groups worship. The next thing that they did was they, they found themselves in a, hard, a hardship. Um, and the, the translation I just read didn't have the name of the place. Um, they said Mesopotamia, which would have been a lot easier. But anyway, therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of King Kushan Rishaphaim of Aram Naharaim, and the Israelites served Kushan Rishaphaim eight years. That was, that was their hardship. They were, God turned them over to be slaves. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, this is the moaning, the, the next of the four uh, in the pattern, the four things that happen in the pattern. And then they're rescued. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the Israelites who delivered them 
Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother. So we see that pattern, and we're gonna we're gonna use that pattern throughout uh, most of the rest of the study, because this is how things went all the way through Judges. They messed up. They turned their back on God. God became angry. Something happened to them that caused them a hardship. The Israelites and they started moaning. And after that, they uh, after God hears their moaning, He raises up somebody to. Uh, help them out, get them out of that situation. Anything on that that you want to talk about? I think it's all pretty much cut and dry. It's very relatable. Yeah, absolutely it is. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, just looking back, you know, throughout my life being, you know, a young teenager turning my back on God and then, you know, Something happens, and then I moan about it, and then I pray about it. I was definitely a rescue prayer. Only prayed when something bad was happening. So it's actually a very relatable book. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I chose it. Um, another reason is we know the story of Samson, but we very rarely talk about any of the other judges. Um, so let's see. The first major judge, I already talked about this, the Baals and the Asherahs. Baal was the Canaanite storm god, and Asherah was his consort. She was the goddess of fertility. And in the original text, both names were plural, so that you could encompass just a wide variety of different gods that uh, were being worshipped. Notice the lowercase g on all those, not the god. Rishathayim, uh, Kushan's last name or title, translates to double wickedness. So he's Kushan the double wicked. Uh, that sounds pretty bad. He's a pretty bad guy. Um, more than likely treated them very, very poorly. Uh, the My translation I just read said uh, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia is northeast of the promised land. And this is not a group of people that would have traveled southwest. Um, uh, there, there's some mountainous area that would have made it difficult for them to, to travel to the promised land. But somehow it happened and they found themselves there and God turned them over, turned the Israelites over to uh, Kushan. And it says at the end that there was peace in the land for 40 years. 40 years may just mean a generation rather than actual 40 years like we measure them now. Um, a lot of times you'll see that periods of time actually mean something completely different from what we're used to. And that was something that I, I didn't want to stop when, as I was reading it, but uh, it said that the Spirit of the Lord uh, came upon Othniel. We're going to see the Spirit of the Lord several times. Uh, there's one instance that should be pretty fresh in your mind. The, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Mary, and she became pregnant with Jesus. Um, so th this is a power or a force from God in which a person is absorbed to become capable of extraordinary deeds. We, we will see that several times. If you're familiar with the story of Samson, uh, you know that God gave him incredible strength. Anything in that passage that you want to talk about or have questions about? Okay. Now, now the sons of Israel, this is, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. This is a long passage. <laughs> Um, but Ehud does a lot of work. I'm, I'm going to pronounce it Ehud because I don't know any different. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and 
um, Amalek, Amalek, gracious, and he went and defeated Israel, and they possessed the city of the palm trees. The sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the sons of Israel cry, cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. And the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Ehud made himself a sword, which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it to his right leg, or his right thigh, excuse me, under his cloak. He presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. It came about when he had finished presenting the tribute that he sent away the people who had carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the idols which were at Gilgal. And he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he said, keep silence. And all who attended him left him. Ehud came to him while he was sitting alone on the, in the, I'm sorry, in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. Ehud stretched out his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. The handle also went in after the blade, and the fat closed in over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and, he, and the refuse came out. Then Ehud went out into the vestibule and shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, his servants came and locked and looked, and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked, and they said, he is only relieving himself in the cool room. They waited until they became uh, anxious, but behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. Therefore, they took the key and opened them, and behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. Now Ehud esca escaped while they were delaying, and he passed by the idols and escaped to Syrah. It came about that when he had arrived that he blew the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim and the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country and he was in front of them. He said to them, pursue them for the Lord has given your enemies to the Moabites, given your enemies the Moabites into your hands. So they went down after him and seized the lords of the Jordan opposite Moab, and they did not allow anyone to cross. They struck down at that time about 10,000 Moabites, all robust and valiant men, and no one escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was undisturbed for 80 years. And that's a long passage. All right, so Ehud is the second major judge, and uh, he comes from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, I won't say too much about that yet because I think I've got it in the, in the notes later on. Modern-day Jewish people come from two of the original tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And remember in chapter 1, we met Judah, he was sent into the southern area of the promised land to drive out the inhabitants. Uh, he was the military leader for that, for that tribe. And it could have meant the whole tribe. Uh, as I went back and reread that, maybe when they, they talked about Judah, they were talking about the entire tribe when. But regardless. So the pattern, going back to that, first the apostasy, the Israelites did again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So already um, what a generation later they're turning their backs on God again. And King Eglon of Moab defeats Israel and takes the city of Palms. The city of Palms is Jericho. If you'll remember Jericho, it, we talked about it a little bit. That was the military base uh, when Joshua was still alive. Remember, Moses brought them to the promised land. Joshua brought them into the promised land. And he set up 
like a military base camp there in Jericho, which is right on the other side of the Jordan River. Then the Israelites moaned. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up Ehud, a left-handed Benjaminite. And if you see that, uh, that they're left, being left-handed in the uh, tribe of Benjamin was very uncommon. Um, and that's going to, that was important to say because later on we're going to see a bunch more left-handed Benjaminites. So I, I just wanted you to be aware of, of how rare this is in that tribe. So the second major judge, if you notice the spirit of the Lord's not mentioned here. So Ehud did all of this on his own with, without God's supernatural force or power working through him. The, the uh, idols that it mentioned in this translation, the other translation that I used to, to write the uh, slides said structured stone near Gilgal. Um, doesn't really explain a whole lot. It doesn't talk about a whole lot with Gilgal and the idols. It's there, I think, to tell us Ehud turned around and went back by himself. Everybody else kept going the, back home. The assassination of the fat king. This is uh, this is really something. This this whole story. Uh, part of the passage. This part of the passage almost has an obscene humor to it. Um, I, you, you can just picture the the sword going in and the fat closing around his hand, and he can't draw the sword back out. Um, I don't know if that's the way it really worked, but that's the picture I get as I read that. Um, he must have really been a big guy. Um, and then after the assassination, pay special attention to what Ehud does next. He goes to the hill country, to Ephraim, and gathers the Israelites. They come down out of the hill country, and Ehud is leading them. They battle with the Moabites and pretty much take out all of them wipe them out. Um, strong young soldiers are wiped out by the Israelites under Ehud's command. And like we said before, 40 years is a generation. 80 years may mean two generations uh, of peace. And then we got one verse. To finish up, was there anything in the story of Ehud that you wanted to talk about, or anything catch your attention? Besides him relieving himself? Yes. <laughs> right. I don't know. I thought the um, death was a little graphic. Didn't it say something about his guts coming out or bowels coming out or something? Yeah. I thought it was graphic. It, it was, yeah. Um, in the other translation that I used to make the slides, it actually read dirt. The dirt came out. Um, so, yeah, probably um, intestines, bowels, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It is kind of graphic. <laughs> but, and that you're supposed to chuckle because it is kind of, that, that whole scene is just interesting. Yeah, like next time started. somebody says they have a secret for me, I'm not gonna, I'm kind of going to get scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bethany, you started to say something. Oh, teenage boys like this story. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, gross. it's real gross. <laughs> it, it, I, I think it's funny, but. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me read you the third, uh, the, the final verse of the chapter. After he came, Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, uh, and he also saved Israel. And that, that's about all we hear, except for one other mention of Shamgar. Um, his name is non-Semitic. 
Uh, Semitic would mean, uh, it refers to a group of languages that uh, include Hebrew, Arabic, Aic. there are about 15 different languages uh, in, included in the Semitic grouping. And uh, his name isn't one of those. So this means that Shamgar was probably not an Israelite. Uh, my uh, commentary said that he may have been a mercenary that traveled down past, uh, from, from beyond Mesopotamia uh, towards the Promised Land. And there was also some suggestion in the commentary that he may, ha he may have been a convert. Uh, he may have been following the Lord once he got to the Promised Land and uh, the people there were talking to him about it, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but there, there's no evidence that that's, any of that's true. That was just what some of the scholars suggested uh, may be the case. This passage seems very strange. It's just, to me, it sounded like an afterthought. It's just, just strange <laughs> to be right here. Uh, we, we've got the, the story of Othniel, and then we get really graphic with Ehud, and then, oh, this guy, Sam, Shamgar, there at the end. Let's just throw him in. Um, but it was inserted here to offer a historical reference to a verse in chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, we're going to read uh, uh, Jessica, not Jessica. There was no Jessica in the Bible. Deborah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, the brain, I guess. Deborah. Um, Deborah. De there's a song of Deborah in chapter five, and that's part of the song. Uh, it talks about Shamgar and his exploits. Shamgar is the third major judge named in this book. But if you remember from the first couple of uh, studies, uh, the first couple of nights we talked about this, judges is not laid out chronologically. So the it, Shamgar actually scholars felt like belonged after the story of Samson, which is in chapter 16. Um, and then I wanted to tell you what an ox goad was because I had to look it up myself. And that's a, a wooden tool, kind of like a cattle prod. It's about eight feet long and that was used to kind of bump the oxen to make them pull a plow or a cart or whatever. Um, some said that there was a, uh, uh, some of the definitions said there was a, like a hoe blade on the, on the other end so that they could scrape the dirt off of the plow blade uh, as it got laid, uh, heavy, heavy down, weighed down. Yeah, okay, so we're at the homework. How far did we go tonight? Half an hour? We're going to, have to start doing two chapters, I think. Um, the homework is read chapter four so that you're ready. I, I'd love to have some discussion. I know a lot, several of you are muting your mics and probably for good reason. Um, but uh, anytime you want to discuss something or jump in and talk about something, just unmute that mic and interrupt me. Uh, I know this isn't a classroom, but we can still interact and, and talk. Um, I'll shut the recording off in a minute. We can just kind of catch up for a couple of minutes before I shut this thing down. So next week we read about the fourth judge, Deborah. And uh, there's all my information. If you do need to reach me, if you want to talk about something in this or talk about something that we talked about tonight or a couple of weeks back. Um, if you just need to talk, that, I'm here all the time. Um, you can always go to YouTube at, at that address and look up the, um, the each recording of this lesson, each lesson. So have a great week. Pray for each other and do something to brighten someone's day this week. So that's Jim. That's Jim. Oh, yeah, that's Jim. <laughs> well, let me see.